uh, thank you all for coming. Unfortunately, I can't see you because I see only black something in front of me, but I'll try to nevertheless uh, speak about Kotlin coroutines. So I'm Svetlana Sakova, I'm a developer advocate, and uh, today I want to focus on Kotlin coroutines, introduce them, explain why, we have so uh, why it's so important feature in the Kotlin language, and uh, show you some examples of how to use them. So let's start. The main purpose of Kotlin coroutines is to simplify asynchronous programming. And uh, Kotlin coroutines, in essence, give us a new way to perform all these asynchronous computations. And uh, it is not a Kotlin invention. The coroutine is not a Kotlin invention. The term coroutines, the concept of coroutines, is known for many years already, for many decades. And uh, in, uh, at the very beginning, it was used to emulate asynchronous computation even, be, even on a, when we don't have multiple threads. And uh, uh, now Kotlin just reuses uh, this concept, and um, uh, uh, we now have it in the language. And uh, now I will explain what it is and uh, uh, why we have this. So let's start with the motivation example, uh, with the motivational example, and um, my motivation would be uh, the. I'll start with the example for a sync await, and um, uh, at first let's start with this very simple piece of code, and uh, it is very simple, consecutive, and straightforward. But it is wrong. The problem with this code is that a loading image might be a very time-consuming operation. And um, uh, while this image is blocked, if we perform this code, if we run this code from the main thread, our user might be blocked because uh, it takes a long time to, to load actually this image. And uh, there are different solutions, uh, solutions to this problem. One of the solutions is to use callbacks. There are, like, uh, you can uh, use them directly, you can uh, use different frameworks. Uh, however, it's still callbacks, and you, uh, in this case, you have to extract uh, what should be done when your operation is completed inside some lambda, and uh, specify that this lambda should be invoked afterwards, after your code completes. And um, uh, using these callbacks often lead to some uh, not really nice, uh, like, uh, pro to different problems, especially concerning uh, that uh, the code is not easy to read, especially when you have uh, a lot of uh, callbacks one inside another, and sometimes it is called callback hell when you have a lot of in indentations for these callbacks. And uh, the solution to this problem, like alternative solution to this problem, would be to use a sync await. And um, uh, a sync await, in essence, uh, allow us to avoid using callbacks here, and to, uh, it allows us to just write this code directly. And uh, if you look at it, it looks directly like uh, our first wrong example. So uh, it is, it is very, very similar to it. So we just write the code consecutively, uh, one instruction after another, without some kind of callbacks, and it somehow works. Note that I haven't yet explained you how this async await works. Uh, my first uh, idea that I want to share is that uh, we want uh, to uh, we want to avoid callbacks, and uh, the feature of coroutines and async await allow us to do that. Async await is also not a Kotlin invention. It uh, is the feature already present in some languages, for instance, C sharp. And uh, if you look at it in C sharp, uh, this feature is a language feature. So these async await are language keywords. In Kotlin, uh, it's, they are not language keywords. Uh, but there are just library functions. And in Kotlin, it works on top of the concept of coroutines. So somehow, the concept of coroutines allow us to have a sync await in the library and to, uh, to enjoy the power of a sync await. Coroutines allow much more than just a sync await, and we'll discuss it a little bit later. But uh, for a start, I want to focus our attention on this async await. So uh, and, uh, now I want to talk about what is a coroutine. So coroutines somehow allow us to, uh, to have this async await. And um, I want to compare 
two concepts, uh, the concept of a thread and a concept of a coroutine, and see what are the similarities with them, uh, with them and what are the differences. So in essence, a coroutine is very similar to a thread. So it is something uh, that, uh, that on the first glance very, it is, uh, looks like a thread. Uh, in which sense? Thread is a sequence of instructions, uh, and multiple threads might, might be executed concurrently and can share some resources. And for coroutines, the same also works. How, and a uh, coroutine is also called a lightweight thread. Uh, that means that we uh, uh, can have much more coroutines, that we can create much more coroutines for our application than threads. So thread is a rather expensive thing. It uh, requires a lot of memory, a lot of resources. And for coroutines, it's no longer the case. Coroutines are really lightweight. And we create like thousands, tens of thousands coroutines in comparison to, uh, for, uh, to threads in our application. So coroutine is uh, something very lightweight. So now we know that coroutine is uh, something similar to a thread, but uh, uh, we can have much more coroutines. Then let's discuss what, uh, how they are different, how coroutine is different to a thread. And uh, to, uh, to explain this difference, I will use uh, the following pictures. So in my talks, I will, I will have uh, lots of pictures today. I understand that it's uh, second half of the day, so you might be tired. I hope that pictures will help. Um, and uh, uh, in the, uh, for, uh, for my notation, I will use uh, the, 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 the following. So uh, the thread will be the line always, and uh, our coroutine is uh, like uh, this computation, and uh, uh, it will be drawn as uh, this block. So uh, the next uh, level, the next uh, understanding of how to think of what a coroutine is, a coroutine is a computation that can be suspended. So it can be run on top of threads, in different threads, and we can suspend coroutines. So somehow we may take this coroutine from the thread, put it somewhere in memory, and later return it back. The question is, why do we need to suspend a computation? Why do we need to suspend a coroutine? And the answer is, uh, like even from this picture, you can see that when we suspend it, our thread is free and can be busy with something else. So uh, for another example, let's uh, consider uh, a situation when you start some two asynchronous computations from a main one, and you need to wait uh, for their result. If you write this code straightforwardly uh, via uh, threads, like uh, start from, from the main thread this computation, uh, another one start them in parallel and wait for them, then uh, while waiting for this computation to complete, your thread will do nothing. And your thread won't be able to do something else. And that's a problem. And if it's just a regular thread, it's uh, just too expensive to lose threads in such a way. But if it's a main UI thread, it's even ro uh, wrong because our thread is blocked and your user is also blocked. So that's, uh, that's why this situation with threads doesn't work real well because like, you cannot uh, write such code. It is readable and straightforward, but uh, it's wrong because you're blocking threads. And coroutines allow us a very interesting thing. You can write very similar code to the one that you would write using threads. However, here you can suspend a computation. And uh, in this case, when you suspend this computation, your thread is not blocked. And this thread can be busy with something else. If it's main thread, then it's uh, like a requirement uh, to have it available for all the requests from, uh, from the users. So uh, suspend, uh, f uh, so coroutine uh, is a computation that can be suspended. And uh, in Kotlin, uh, we have uh, the special marker to mark a such computation that can be suspended, and that is suspend modifier. When you see a suspend function, that means that this function represents this computation that can be suspended. So now when you write code in Kotlin using coroutines, you will see a lot of such suspend functions. 
Now let's go back to our Im to my image example and uh, the story of async await, and let's unwrap how exactly this async await, await works. Uh, first, we want to start uh, a new computation while loading the image. So we write the function load image async, and uh, this load image async starts somewhere loading the image, so it starts a new computation on some thread. We'll later discuss on which thread exactly it should start. And then when we use await, when we call await on this asynchronous computation, that uh, will mean that our whole, this process image computation uh, is suspended, will be suspended and later returned and later restored. So await, uh, if you see how await is defined, you'll find out that it is defined uh, as a suspend function. So <clears throat> here we call a sync, and a sync returns as an instance of a deferred type. It's a synonymous uh, for future, uh, something that uh, uh, is promised to, uh, to complete in some time. And uh, we can call a wait on such a deferred object, and uh, this await is uh, indeed defined as a suspend, which means that, yes, this is a marker that suspends our computation. So uh, let's unwrap uh, this example. Uh, we, can, uh, ex uh, like we can extract this load image async into a separate variable uh, to better understand what's going on. And uh, here, at first, we started uh, this uh, loading image. We started new computation. And, the, uh, and we have now two computations, one on the main thread that started another one, and um, a new one, like in my picture green one, that is loading the image. Then, when, uh, we, the, when the code in the first computation reaches a weight, that is a marker that tells the compiler to suspend this computation if the result is not yet ready. So here, uh, a weight uh, uh, refers to, uh, to some computation to uh, offloading the image, and uh, until the result is not ready, we suspend the main process image computation somewhere, and uh, now our thread is free to perform another tasks. And then, when the result of a loading image, when the image is loaded and the result is already available, then we can return, then the compiler returns after automatically our suspended computation to a thread and continues it. So that's how a sync and a wait works, work. You may ask here, on which thread uh, my computation, my suspended computation will be continued? And the answer to, to this is that you specify that. By default, uh, the, uh, the, pool, uh, the thread pool is, the default thread pool is used, uh, and uh, that means that uh, your uh, computation might be continued to, uh, on any thread from the default thread pool. However, you may specify that, okay, this uh, is something that should be uh, run only on the main UI thread, and in this case, when you suspend this computation, you continue it on the main thread. And note how uh, our main thre thread might be busy with something else when our coroutine is suspended. So when we have this blue coroutine somewhere suspended, we can do, we can perform another tasks on the main thread. So that's our, like, uh, that's our win, that's what we wanted to gain. Oh, sorry. Uh, so here, uh, in uh, this example, we probably set image on the main UI thread. So when we call a sync, we specify that this computation should be, uh, should be run on the main UI thread. However, uh, there is another interesting story that Kotlin coroutines are not only a sync await. So here we see this, this pattern, and uh, it is uh, the feature that you may be already familiar with if you, uh, if you fi found it uh, before in other languages like C-sharp, and that's exactly the same functionality. This async await uh, allow you to, uh, to run something asynchronously on a different uh, thread and then wait for, for, uh, for each result. However, Kotlin coroutines are not only async await. 
you can do more things with uh, Kotlin coroutines. And uh, one of the most important things that you can do is you can define your own suspend functions. So now the way how, we how you write your, uh, your code differs uh, from, uh, from your, like, uh, your habit, habits uh, can differ because now you can think in terms of defining something as a suspend function. So whenever you have uh, something that uh, might uh, wait and uh, block a thread, instead you can, uh, you, you can now declare it as a suspend function. An example. Here we have a simple consecutive logic. Uh, first, uh, we want to uh, log in our user to get some uh, user ID, then uh, we load some data using this user ID, and uh, in the end, we show the data. If we just write this code in this manner, uh, in a consecutive, clear way, it will be wrong because uh, we have here we have two places where uh, our user can be blocked because uh, we have uh, here probably some network operations and uh, they may take a long of time and during this time your user will, will need to wait. So uh, that's something that we somehow try to, would like to avoid, to block the user. So what are solutions to, 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 this, to this problem? You can uh, use uh, completable features, for instance, to, to rewrite uh, the same code uh, and uh, to, uh, to allow, not, uh, to, to avoid this uh, blocking user. Uh, then you will need to use uh, some API of these completable features. And or uh, if we are talking about probably Android uh, or some other cases, you can also use RxJara. It also allows you to rewrite this simple straightforward code in a uh, RxJava style. However, for this simple case, when we just have uh, some consecutive actions like log in, log, load data, and show this data, in this case, in this scenario, RxJava might be a, a kind of overcomplication. So if you compare their initial code with what we have with these, uh, all these frameworks, you'll find out that with frameworks, it's, uh, it's less, it, it becomes less clear uh, in, in, in some uh, cases that are not probably intended to be, to be processed in this way. So what we can do with a sync await? Now we have the power of a sync await, and we can rewrite our code, our initial example, using this async await functionality. And uh, how we do it is we, uh, in, uh, now when we implement our login function, instead of just performing our login operation, we, uh, we try to perform it like somewhere in the background and uh, probably and return uh, an, uh, a deferred object that might be awaited. So that's, that's how we program with a sync await. We say, okay, uh, start this login operation, then await it, await for it. And the same with uh, load user data. So now we changed the return types of these functions, two functions, login and load user data, now return as deferred objects. And after each call, we simply await for the result. So our code, uh, to my mind, it looks, uh, more clear than uh, the previous uh, one with the RxJava frameworks, but uh, probably it's a matter of choice. So I think it would help us here to simplify this code. Okay, so well, so good. But with Kotlin suspend functions, we can do even more. In this scenario, we can simply define these functions as suspend function. And that will, will mean exactly that this suspend function that is some computation that might be suspended. So whenever we uh, use, we, we, we access for user lo login, uh, that uh, is a network operation that might be long and uh, we want to be able to, uh, to suspend uh, it until it waits for the result. So we simply define our function as suspend function and you see that uh, the code afterwards, the code like, that shows user info, is uh, the same as we had uh, in the first wrong slide when we blocked the user. 
So that's what we have, the, that's the benefit that we have with coroutines. We had uh, our first very simple code that probably you write at the first when you just need uh, something to get working and when you are not uh, very concerned uh, with the performance. But then when you start to understand that, hey, user need to block, uh, need to wait too much and it's too slow, you may decide to convert it to the suspend function. You don't need to rewrite everything and to change uh, the model. That is a not, uh, th that is a kind of slight modification. And you can, uh, w whenever you write it, you can define uh, them suspend uh, at the beginning when you understand it. Yes, this is something that might be suspended, uh, but the main idea is that it is very similar to the, it doesn't change the way how you write code. You just add these suspend modifiers, but everything else stays the same. So we just added these suspend modifiers, and IntelliJ also nicely highlights, and Studio, they nicely highlight uh, the suspension points of this coroutine, of this function. So in this case, uh, in the, uh, so show user info function is a computation that might be suspended, and it might be suspended in, uh, possibly in two places. And we clearly see where it can be suspended. At first, it can be suspended when we call login because it is also suspend function, so that's something that can be suspended. And it can be suspended when we load user data, again, because it's some, some point uh, where, which uh, represents computation that can be suspended. So we clearly see these suspension points. Uh, on the declaration side, because uh, we have the suspend modifier, and when we use them, because IntelliJ nicely highlights them. You may ask here, where can I call these suspend functions? And the answer would be that you can call uh, suspend functions inside another suspend functions, like in the previous example, and inside, uh, uh, we, we saw already a sync. A sync is one. Uh, example of such coroutine builder. Uh, there are some others like launch. So uh, these are called coroutine builders. And um, uh, the difference, uh, the main difference between a sync and launch is that a sync returns you uh, like a deferred object that returns you some result. So for instance, here it is a result. Uh, w w we have deferred with the res uh, that should return you an integer in the end. And launch uh, returns you a deferred, some kind of deferred or future object without the result. So that's uh, the main difference between them. So kind of launch returns you uh, the deferred of unit, but there are different types. And um, if we look at how these suspend, uh, these coroutine builders are defined, we'll find out that uh, they mark uh, their lambda parameters as suspend modifier, with, uh, also with suspend modifier. And then the right answer to the question where you can use your suspend functions is inside suspend functions or is inside these suspend lambdas. But there's some kind of technical implementation details. You can nest coroutines inside, like you can start a coroutine inside another coroutine. So for instance, here we have the launch main coroutine, and uh, we start async, uh, uh, we asynchronously load image uh, inside this coroutine. And uh, there, uh, at this moment, an interesting story begins because uh, there is, uh, like, you may ask here, uh, what about errors and what about exceptions? And what happens, for instance, if your nested coroutine, uh, uh, th that uh, an error occurs in your nested coroutine, and uh, will it be canceled, will the uh, auto be canceled, and so on. And uh, um, the answer to this question, the solution to this, was uh, finally introduced in a very recent update to Kotlin coroutines. And uh, like before, uh, their general advice was that you uh, have to handle it manually. However, uh, now uh, there is uh, this concept of uh, structural concurrency. And uh, this thing also changes a little bit how you, uh, how you 
write your code using uh, these concepts of Kotlin of, of, of coroutines. So uh, let's again look at uh, some example. And uh, here we have a classical <coughs> example to show you two asynchronous computation. So uh, we, uh, lo we want to load two images, both asynchronously. So if you have enough, thre enough threads, they will be loaded in parallel. And uh, afterwards, uh, when uh, both of the images are loaded, we want to, to overlay them, to, so to do something with both of these images. So uh, we know now that we define this function. The, uh, <coughs> when we call first await, the main computation is suspended. Like for simplicity, for simplicity, I just uh, uh, use. You, I just say here that, that our computation is suspended once, but actually we have to await uh, calls here, so our computation might be uh, returned back, see that this, whether the second result is ready or not, and then. Uh, suspend it again. Uh, so in this simple case, like what? Okay, th that's fine. But what can possibly go wrong? And uh, uh, the problem here is, like, what happens if uh, some exception is thrown inside a coroutine? So uh, while we image, while we are loading, for instance, the first image, the green one, what what happens to the second image, for instance? And um, to answer that, first I need to, sh to tell you that, like what generally happens with exceptions? Uh, await just rethrows exceptions. So if your coroutine that if your coroutine that you started throws some exception, you may catch it uh, while calling await, and uh, your exception will be correctly caught. Uh, if you don't uh, surround, so you can simply uh, use a regular try catch and surround this await function with try catch to uh, process uh, this exception in the correct way. Uh, if you don't uh, catch this exception, then it will be simply rethrown uh, further upper. Uh, like await just rethrows uh, this exception. The problem is that uh, if, for instance, an exception is thrown when uh, your first uh, image is loaded, then no one uh, says the second image uh, to stop loading. So uh, no one cancelled uh, the second started process if you don't do it somehow manually. By default, nothing happens. So this exception is uh, thrown uh, upward, upwards, and probably you want, in this case, to stop everything, to cancel all the started tasks. Uh, and, um, but by default, and like bef before this introduction of structural con concurrency, this was indeed a problem. But now, with uh, structural concurrency, we have uh, we can say that, and actually, we uh, not only we can say, but by default, uh, all our coroutines that we started are structures uh, are structured, and you start a coroutine in there in some outer scope. And in this case, uh, like you see, there is the difference from the previous example is that we introduced, uh, we, use, we are using now this coroutine scope. And uh, the difference is that uh, now, uh, if uh, your, for one of your ch child, children coroutines is canceled, then the outer scope uh, before returning uh, will uh, clear up everything. We'll, we'll wait until its children uh, are finished, or will uh, or will cancelled if uh, if it's cancelled. So now uh, these children coroutines are cancelled automatically if someone cancels their their upper coroutine. And uh, even it, in this case, when an exception in, is thrown in one of the child coroutines, it also means that the parent coroutine is cancelled unless it uh, processes this exception correctly. So uh, now with structured concurrency and with introduction of introducing of coroutine, sco coroutine scope, you can uh, y uh, you uh, specifically uh, la launch, specifically start your new coroutines in, the, uh, in some context, and uh, they are uh, 
uh, and they are automatically uh, processed. Uh, th their life cycle is, uh, is depending on their uh, outer scope. Uh, the difference uh, that was introduced in this late release, so probably if you already used coroutines, uh, you know that uh, you can use a sync await uh, directly from any point. And um, that means that these new coroutines are started in some global scope. However, now after this, uh, after the latest difference in uh, uh, and in coroutines 1.0, there'll be uh, the, uh, th these async and launch functions uh, are defined uh, as extensions on this scope. And uh, whenever you launch or whenever you start a new coroutine, it's always started in this scope. So by def you, you may specify, if you don't have some scope, you may specify that, okay, start my new coroutine in the global scope. So that uh, might be a default option, but uh, a little bit later I'll show you the uh, better solution. So the difference is that now your coroutines are always binded, are always connected with the scope. And now, uh, whenever you start, whenever you want to start a new coroutine in some, uh, somewhere, in some other thread, some new asynchronous computation, you have to explicitly say that I, uh, you, you, you have to explicitly define this function, this stars and new coroutine as an extension on coroutine scope. So that's another difference that, uh, that brings this uh, structured concurrency approach that, uh, that influences how you write your code. So now, when uh, we write this function load image async, and it starts a new coroutine, this new coroutine, this loading image will be connected, will be binded to this outer scope, depending on what scope uh, we, are, we are starting it from. In this case, uh, we just uh, used co uh, coroutine uh, scope uh, function, uh, but the, uh, the supposed way uh, how to like where uh, where to bind all your newly started coroutines, all your newly created computations, uh, is uh, like uh, there, there, there is this question where to bind them, and the answer is that uh, often you have in your application some objects with a well-defined life cycle. So if we are talking about Android. Uh, the, such object is an activity. So an activity is an object with a well-defined life cycle. Uh, when we're talking about some other frameworks, uh, they're always, uh, they're, they're usually some, uh, uh, th th this kind of uh, something uh, with, uh, with life cycle. And it, uh, we can bind all our children coroutines to, uh, to, this, uh, to this life cycle. To accomplish it, you do a, a very easy thing. So, for instance, you can extend your, not extend, but implement by your activity coroutine scope. And if you implement coroutine scope, then you can uh, start all your new computations. Do remember that uh, now uh, we can only start, we can only use, a, we, we can only call a sync and uh, launch uh, from some coroutine scope because they are extensions to coroutine's scope. And uh, now, uh, because our activity extends coroutine scope, we can simply uh, call a sync await, or, or sorry, a sync or launch, or uh, call our uh, custom uh, function starting new coroutines from this ac activity without some uh, spe without any specification. So we, uh, after you uh, correctly define this scope for your class, then you can easily call this async await from the class, uh, easily e easily create new coroutines from your class, and they will be automatically binded to the life cycle of your class of your of your object. So that's uh, the, the core difference. Now with structured concurrency, uh, the life cycle of your coroutines is uh, correctly co uh, covered and it is bound to activity, to, 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 uh, your, to, to activity or another object in your system uh, with its own life cycle. 
So uh, I've shown you dust, implement the coroutine scope, and uh, uh, now how to, how to do actually, how to implement this uh, coroutine scope. That's also easy, that's just some pattern that you may, that you may use for your, uh, for your application. So whenever it takes, uh, whether it's activity or some other class, uh, there, uh, the task is very easy, so you implement coroutine scope, and uh, uh, then, uh, you want to uh, to uh, do some like little ceremony when you create your like instance of your class with life cycle and when you destroy it. So in the case of activity, we have on create and on destroy, and on create we create so called job. So uh, job represents uh, the lifetime of the activity, and. Um, uh, in this case, uh, we created like we, we created this job, and whenever inside your activity you call uh, either either a sync launch or your custom async functions, they are bound to uh, to this job. They will be automatically bound to this to this uh, to this coroutine context uh, because you here overloaded this coroutine context library. And when your activity is destroyed uh, by calling this job cancel, you simply cancel all the children coroutines. So that's, uh, that's the main idea, how to control uh, your children uh, coroutines uh, from, from your application. Uh, there might be a question uh, what is uh, the difference between, like, uh, not what is it, but when to use, uh, when to define something as a suspend function, or when to define uh, something as an extension to this coroutine scope? Because I've I've, to, I've I've shown you that now you can now uh, it brings you like the new way to uh, to structure your code and to write your code because now in your application you you uh, define some functions as suspend function, meaning that uh, they might be uh, suspended because they uh, they require some uh, some jo uh, some job from. Uh, for something, uh, if you uh, like, if y usually uh, s your such functions may use some uh, API uh, that uh, might be blocked that requires callbacks. That, but uh, there is uh, uh, there is a way how to how to use uh, such uh, uh, API uh, rewriting it uh, to this to, to to such suspend functions. So you basically uh, add some additional methods uh, to the function, to the library, some library functions uh, that are written with callbacks, and afterwards you use them uh, from this coroutine model. So, but then uh, go ba let's go back to our question. Here we have a uh, suspend function. Uh, we, we can now write f uh, some functions as suspend functions, and we also can uh, start some new coroutines, and uh, we know that when we start some new coroutines, we define, uh, we define it as a coroutine scope function. And uh, there a uh, proposed a way to distinguish between them and to decide whenever to use which is uh, that when you define your suspend function and uh, uh, you are interested uh, in its result. You are interested uh, in uh, uh, you, you, you interested in, this, in, in, the, in its result immediately. Uh, then you define it as a suspend function. So here uh, you, you you probably remember in my previous in my first example with this login, uh, when when I defined it as something that returns deferred, I have to call away wait, try to wait. And this is a kind of mark that, yes, in this situation, suspend works better. Uh, but when you start some new computations, when you start new asynchronous computation, uh, one asynchronous computation, or probably it will be several asynchronous computation, and then you either not interested in the result whatsoever, uh, so they will just uh, continue to compute on their own, that's fine, or you are interested in its results sometime later. In these cases, you, uh, you are defining 
uh, such function and an, as an extension on a coroutine scope. And the rule is uh, like the convention, so it's like kind of a convention. The convention is not to mix the two, so not to define extensions on coroutine uh, scope as suspend functions in order to clearly understand the purposes of the functions uh, concerning this uh, suspension coroutines model. So that's, uh, that's new suggested ways of, of writing uh, your code uh, that uh, might be suspended and uh, that may require this suspension mechanism. Some implementation details of how these coroutines are implemented under the hood. Uh, so whenever you uh, write some suspend function, under the hood, this suspend function uh, at the byte code level uh, t uh, takes uh, additional parameter. So uh, it is generated to take this additional parameter and the compiler automatically uh, generates uh, this parameter. So uh, if we look at continuation, it's a kind of a ge generic callback interface. And uh, to some extent, uh, coroutines uh, work through the same callbacks mechanism like before. Like w when we start discussing that you can solve such problems with callbacks. However, now all these callbacks are hidden by the, comp uh, by the compiler, are hidden in the uh, bytecode implementation of this function, and uh, uh, the compiler generates all these callbacks automatically for you. So that's one way to, uh, like one simplified way to, to think about it. And uh, when we are looking at uh, like what 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 is this continuation? So I saw you that here we have so, some hidden parameter continuation, and uh, what uh, what is this continuation? When we uh, suspend a function, so for instance in this example, I have a function, and uh, the uh, the first line login is my first suspension point. So uh, when I suspend a function here, uh, there, uh, there, uh, there are, uh, there, uh, when I say that uh, computation is stored somewhere, uh, like this continuation interface, uh, continuation object is uh, stored and it contains all the information of the uh, exact point when we stopped this computation, when we suspended this computation. So this continuation contains information of the values of the local variables, of the parameters, the, uh, the point uh, where in the uh, function are we, so that's, uh, that's automatically uh, stored. So uh, in a way, uh, this, uh, the rest of uh, my uh, function after the suspension point goes inside this uh, generic callback continuation. And whenever we, rest when we restore this function, it continues from, uh, it restores its state and continues from the point where it was suspended with the newly uh, results that we got from this uh, suspension function. So the same works uh, for the second suspend point. Here we have another, like the rest of the code becomes continuation and uh, for the same for the last suspension point. Again, uh, the rest of the code becomes this continuation. Uh, another uh, implementation detail is uh, that uh, the, co the body of the coroutine is compiled under the hood to a state machine and uh, basically uh, the number of suspension points uh, that you find inside a function. So that's uh, uh, here we actually, we don't know how many suspension points do we have because uh, we don't know the implementation of login function of load user data, etc. cetera. But, uh, but uh, w uh, w when we store this, uh, com this computation, this coroutine, uh, 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 it is uh, implemented by the state machine and each suspension point is one of the state. So when we reach first suspension point, we suspend the coroutine and then uh, restore it, et cetera, et cetera. They continued uh, to, uh, to, to, to perform the code, reach the second uh, suspension point, uh, suspended it, restored it later, et cetera. So that's, uh, that was almost all about uh, what I wanted to share about coroutines. 
uh, some uh, the, uh, the the like Kotlin coroutines is are much uh, even more than just uh, uh, that just a single way then suspend functions and uh, and uh, the uh, exact coroutines. So uh, again, the uh, the concept of coroutines lives in the language. So uh, this. Uh, language supports the suspend modifier for suspend functions, uh, so coroutine uh, builders like suspend, su suspend lambdas, and some um, ways to, and uh, the, all this magic of sus suspending uh, the computation and restoring it back. And everything else is built on top of it and lives in the library. So there is a sync await. There are also uh, the support for more complicated concepts like channels or actors. You can also implement uh, that uh, via coroutine and use them. And uh, there is a separate thing as yield. Yield is also in Kotlin implemented via coroutines. You can find information about coroutines uh, in our site. So now you can, uh, you can read everything about them there. Uh, and also, I would recommend, if you want to, uh, to, to learn more, uh, there are talks at KotlinCon by Roman Elzarev, who is, uh, uh, who, who is the lead developer of the, uh, uh, of the Kotlin libraries, including Kotlin Coroutines. And uh, uh, here, he explains this concept. And uh, in the last talk uh, at KotlinCon, he, he explains this concept of uh, structural concurrency in detail. So if you want more about it, you can, you can try it. So uh, I'm all, uh, thank you uh, very much for your attention, and have a nice Scotland with coroutines. <laughs>